A very good morning to all the dignitaries present on the dais and all my fellow student managers. I, Diksha Pandey, student manager of BIIB Shribalaji Society, feel privileged to introduce you all to a prominent personality, Mr. Uday Gupta. Sir is a mechanical engineer from Jadavpur University, Calcutta with first class honors. Sir has done his post graduation from Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, where he was a recipient of merit award. Sir was appointed as the CEO of Steel Business in 2008 in Musco. In 2011, Sir took over as a managing director of Musco, now Mahindra Sanyu Special Steel Private Limited. Sir also has a work experience of 26 years in companies which include First Aluminium Nigeria PLC and Indian Aluminium Co Limited. So now we'd like to call upon Mr. Uday Gupta to inspire us with his ocean of knowledge. Sir, the dais is all yours. Thank you. Okay, let me start my rapid fire questions. You know, just raise your hand. I can see more or less all of you. It's, it's a great gathering. How many of you like uh, jazz? Oh, pretty good. How many of you like Metallic. That's not bad. How many of you make friends and do not add friends? Really, this is not the right feedback. You don't add, you add. How many of you hate smartphones? I like to meet you, sir, after some time. Truly impressed. How many of you can propose I to I without sending it through WhatsApp? <laughs> Fantastic. I never thought you could. <laughs> My daughter cannot. All these rapid fire questions was just to take some database, but I really do not know what to do with the database. And that's the problem with industry today. Huge amount of data, but we do not know what to do with it. So, as Dr. Padi says, things are changing. You know, we've never talked about data analytics at any point of time. We had our Excel sheets. We know how to calculate. The results come out, good, bad, ugly, go ahead with life. But today, this amount of insurmountable data sometimes puts you into a very tragic scenario. You really feel helpless what to do. And those are the areas today are developing at a much faster speed than a mechanical engineer can do on the shop floor, you know, maintaining his machines. Let me delayer myself a bit more. Uh, she spoke very flowery things <laughs> about me, uh, after I did my post-graduation, I was on bench for doing my PhD. I embarked on it. And Madras had a kind of uh, exchange program with Technical University of Stuttgart. And I was supposed to go there and take up my PhD. But there's a very interesting thing used to happen during our time. I do not know whether it happens now. Some of my friends said, come along, we are going to give job interviews, first class fare, second class travel, rest of the money we can spend around, you know, moving from cities to cities. So I fell into the trap and I fell for a corporate glitter after, you know, attending for the interview and I took up the job my first job in Indian aluminium in Maharashtra itself, very close to Panwell. And I realized that uh, most probably I didn't take the right decision for simple reason. I was not a very bad boy. I used to generally listen to my parents. And I knew the dreaded phone call will come in the evening. And then it came from my mother. Uh, Generally, she was very cheerful, but very disappointing voice that, why did you change your decision and did not go for PhD? So, not 26 years, but after 35 years of working, I finally, when the retirement is 
round the corner, maybe around three years, four years, five years down the line, decided to do my PhD so that I can prove it to her, whatever she is, that promises are made to be kept and not broken. And the most interesting part of doing the PhD now that I don't have any pressure of time. You know, when you do it after your post-graduation, within three years you got to complete, within four years you got to complete, now there is no pressure of time. You have got all the time on art to do your PhD. And thank you for calling me today. I think there could not be a better topic to understand how the world will move forward in 21st century. And if you, you know, allow me, why not I do it here? You are saying yes? Oh, thank you so much. Students, to tell you very frankly, we can come here, we can come here, we can talk to you, we can give lectures, we can show our PowerPoint slides. Oh, one more question, how many of you are exhausted of looking at PowerPoints? Good, things are changing for your information. Generally, we are now told, don't put up your PowerPoint slides, just talk, just interact, you know, don't put up your PowerPoint slides. But we are so helpless, we cannot do without our PowerPoint slides. We need at least four or five of them to keep talking to you. The issue is, I find myself a bit asynchronous, out of time, to stand here and talking to you about uh, how to guide yourself or guide myself into the, the path of 21st century. Because why I said I am a bit asynchronous? Because if you have a 35 years of experience behind you, generally it is, it is construed that you do not know the path. And why? Because I'll always look back into my success, success stories of the past, the recipe that made me successful, and I'll try to, you know, come and put jargon on those success recipes, which is definitely not going, it's definitely not going to work when you walk into 21st century. New things have to thought about, and who could be a better, and I really feel like sitting on the other side of the auditorium, and listening to some of them, how do they think should, we should walk into the 21st century. And I have put in a system of reverse mentoring. You understand reverse mentoring, most of you. There are very knowledgeable, five young, you know, vibrant kind of managers we have. They have just onboarded in one or two years. And they keep talking to me. And I learn so much from them. You know, we, I, and I, I'm, I'm being very honest that some of you should have been here to talk about how should we walk into 21st century and not the other way down. Having said that, the, the platform is set, so I need to go ahead and tell you something. Can you see or? Okay. Why I said I am asynchronous because, you know, I am on the liability side. Why I'm on the liability side? Because I told you my mindset of the past. My current do's and don'ts that I have acquired over a period of time won't work when I walk into the 21st century. My lens of seeking opportunity is probably a bit old. I cannot spot opportunity the way you can spot opportunity in the horizon. My risk appetite is low. If you cannot take the right kind of risk, you do not move forward. My ability to change business models, you know, I'm just using some management terms because I've come to deliver uh, a lecture in a management school. The business model need to change very, very fast. Can I do it? I don't know. I, I have not tested myself to that extent. My strategy framework is of the past. I don't know how much Professor Porter has traveled after I did my management uh, course in MDI. State. You know, if you look at the five powers, when you look at the buyer power, it was a sense of competitive value snatching. How much I can snatch from him or how much he can snatch from me. But today the collaborative effect has become so large in the world, the buyer power has transformed into a kind of a different meaning. You know, can we do it together? You know, without collaboration, we cannot move ahead. 
threat of substitutes was one of the power. That's an opportunity. If you do not change your business model and distract yourself, most probably you will go down in the next five years. Because you know this data, you know, I'm not trying to pull up data from the archive and trying to tell you because you read it much more today than I do. You know, 1960, what was the average lifespan of a company? Just a rough guess. How many years a company used to survive in the stock exchange in, back in 1960? Any idea? Just give a wild guess, don't, you know, doesn't matter. 60 years. What is today? That's right, it's around 20 years today. 2025, the average lifespan will be roughly 10 years. So most of the companies who go down the path of history and, not, and do not survive because they could not change the, the, you know, the business model, bring in new product, bring in new services. So do you think it's a competitive force any longer? That's an opportunity. So I am not saying Professor Porter's model is invalid. But we got to look at the Professor Porter's model in slightly different way than we have been taught back in 1990s, okay? That's my request to you. You know, when you look at those framework, whether it's five forces, value chain, look at it through slightly different lens because the world has changed today. My competence is, and this is the most important thing, if I have understood how to walk into 21st century, it's not technology. It, you know, those things will come. You cannot halt technology, it will come. But if you do not have the right competence, you will be lagging behind. Today, again, at the age I have crossed 55, do you think I have the right competencies to guide, to lead into 21st centuries? I do not think until unless I, I gear myself up with the new competencies, I should be able to guide. Because I come from a control era. I come from a command control era. There's a lot of hierarchy. I talk, somebody has to listen. No, today you got to listen mutually. Change as usual. What does it mean? It's an incremental change. It's just another jargon. So I am still of the era of incremental change. If you have done continuous improvement, I am very happy. I, I get my performance appraisal right. But going forward, I think these are the competencies that one should have. Can I unlearn very fast whatever I have learned? If I cannot, sidetracked. Am I teachable? Because after 45, people are not teachable, generally. You know, I know it all. Why should I learn? So you got to bring in that competency. I do not know what are the generic competencies behind it. Are you teachable every day? Can I use whole brain approach? Any show of hand who understands this? Whole brain approach? No show of hand, okay. You should have given it a good try. Anybody from that side? Right, so which is the logical part of the brain? And what is the creative part of the brain? So do you think we can keep it as apart? How many of you are engineers here? How many of you come from social science? Humanities. No, sociology, humanities, right. That's, that's one of the issues. You know, you must talk to your friends, colleagues, whoever, you know, because we have been taught to use only one part of the brain, which is the logical brain. Go by logic. Going into 21st century, only logic will not take you there. You need to be intuitive. You need to understand what is creativity. It should come to you automatically as in a throw of dice. So how to develop that competency? If you ask the question after I have ended my lecture, I say I do not know, but I know intuitively today that you need to apply both part of your brains. You need to look at scenarios. You know, strategic plan, when we joined the company, it was for five years, thick document. 
then it has come down to three years. We don't find relevance of one year of strategic plan also, because strategy and planning have dissociated themselves. You got to have a discovery driven journey. Tomorrow morning, what will happen, we do not know. Under that situation, how do you write a three year strategic document? We do not know. So, but you should be careful about scenario planning. If this happens, what to do? If that happens, what to do? Go wild on your imagination on scenario planning. People have not thought about that scenario. You got to think about that scenario. Today, BP, in next 10 years, British Petroleum, in next 10 years, they are going to become a renewable company. That's how they are working. Imagine, from oil and gas to becoming a renewable, changing their business model, it takes guts, man. You've got to be very bold on your scenario planning. How do you inject innovation? Because without innovation, we are all dead in the industrial world. I talked about the discovery-driven journey. You discover, you make your plan, you make your scenario, you move ahead. And finally, it is the interconnectedness. It's, it, it's, that's, it comes from a very age-old document of ours, which is Veda. You know, we have discovered it after a long time. Until unless you can connect between scenarios, you have a system thinking capability, it will be very difficult to move into 21st century. And I can share with you all, with all frankness, that I don't have any of these competencies. And hence my hypothesis that I am not the right person out here to stand and give a lecture to you, teaching you, because I do not know about the subject. Some talk about Mahindra, because most of you might be knowing. We do not call ourselves a conglomerate, but we call ourselves a federation of businesses. The, the subtle difference is each company is not subsidized by any other company. We got to stand on our own value. We are roughly around 18 billion US dollar company. We have got more than 200,000 people working in six continents and we are present in almost 100 countries. You know, all of you must be knowing about auto and farm, the tractors, financial service, but we have also aerospace and defense in our portfolio. It's a very interesting journey for Mahindra because it was a very low lying, not so much talked about corporate group in up to 1992, 93. Then the growth has been phenomenal. And uh, the, the success path which was drawn by Anand Mahindra was absolutely fascinating. We are very proud to be working in a company like Mahindra. Uh, we are a very small part of Mahindra group, but uh, they started with steel back in 1945 with steel trading and we are still in the steel. And we have survived more or less 55 years, so not a bad company. You know, people who are survived for 20 years, if we have survived six, 55 years, it's good. Uh, we generally produce alloy steel in a place called Kopoli. In some of you are going to Lonawala, you can come and visit us. It's, it's steel melting to making steel bars. It's not a very glamorous industry, but it goes into our daily cores. Like if you are running an op automobile, make you can be 80% sure that you are using our steel either in the engine or in the bearings. If you are in a uh, you know, high-speed train, the axle must be coming from us. You know, so the portfolio is pretty good. In the drive for 21st century, uh, we fully believe, we talk about age of disruption, we talk about artificial intelligence, we talk about IoT, we talk about all, but one thing has to be kept in mind, and this is a firm belief, and most of you will feel this as you walk into your industrial uh, life or business life. Without considering the planet and the society, you cannot move ahead. So it's not only making profit. When we joined the company, we have been asked how much you made. What is the profit? Today the question has changed. How did you make the profit? Did you make the profit by not looking at the environmental capital or the social capital? Then your profit is not sustainable. This is now proven. Going ahead, if I have one simple advice for you, think of the planet and the society and profit together. 
Because that's the only way to move forward. <coughs> so I wish I would have shown you my, uh, you know, our business sustainability framework. It's interesting, but let me read from you. I'll read from here. You know, ethics. I think it's one of the courses, madam, isn't it here? How many of you doze off in that class? Uh, you are not giving true feedback, man. Okay. Believe me, be awake. Because one of the greatest capital that you can build today is the reputation capital. And if you come to our office, I can show by data that our market share in many companies have gone up because we could hold our reputation capital very, very, very tightly. Because Anand is very clear about it when he talks to us that we have built up this over a long period of time for simple things we, and short term results we cannot pawn our long term asset which is reputation capital. It really helps and it really helps when you have BMW, when you have SKF, when you have uh, Daimler in your value chain and when you go and talk about what you do on reputation capital, on social capital, on environmental capital, price, quality, delivery, everything remaining same with my competitor, I can see the market share or the share of business is inching up. It's a great, great tool to lock in your customer. We feel that innovation and organizational culture plays a major role in when you talk about planet profit and people together. And one of the tools that we have developed over a period of time, which I wanted to show it to you again, uh, a small slide, a short slide on that. Every time you got to inculcate this competency, how do you see risk and how do you see opportunity? You know, the Chinese word of risk and opportunity is same. It's called Xi. It's the same word. You can interpret it as risk. You can interpret as opportunity. So this is one skill if you can develop, I think your pathway to 21st century will be good. Like, if you, if you cannot take a risk, it's very risky today. Do you understand, can you make your business zero risk? How many of you believe that we can make it zero risk? Do you believe we can make any business zero risk? Another question to us, do you think we should make our business zero risk? Do you think we should make our business zero risk? I mean, why not, any one of you? It's a very interesting answer. Yeah. Okay, the other way of telling it is, just put the money in Reserve Bank of India, go home and sleep peacefully. You get the return. Until unless India collapses, your money will never collapse, okay? But how to take the risk? How much to take the risk? Do you see opportunity in that risk taking? That's the game we play. And that's the game has to be played as you move forward. Unfortunately, I have to skip something. Uh, one more question. You know, when you, you must be reading the balance sheet of various companies. Did you detect that there are many companies in the world today where the market capitalization far outweighs the book value. Do you, if you don't understand, I'll just explain. Not that I also understand fully. Each company has got a market capitalization, isn't it? They have got a share value multiplied by the number of shares outstanding, you get the market capitalization. But if you look at their balance sheet, fixed asset or tangible asset as we call it, it's very small compared to the market capitalization. Why it happens? Yeah, in our, our days we used to call it goodwill. Now it is more or less defined. Whether it is your IP, whether it is your knowledge, whether it is the talent, talented people you hold, or can you, can you show the world that your competencies are much ahead of your competition? And uh, customer satisfaction, one of the biggest intangible asset, asset that we have seen. So that's the game. So if you want to play the game in 21st century, you know, 
again going back we used to know how to treat fixed asset and i can i started as a maintenance engineer and being the first life i cannot forget if you clean my slate today and say where well, do take up the next job again maintenance engineer no issues but as you know my wife and my uh, sister they decided that their daughter will never get married to a maintenance engineer but that's another story for another day but the issue is we knew how to manage fixed asset we do not know how to manage intangible asset okay so you got to pick up the skill and competencies of managing you know intangible asset that's where the game will be played again coming back to competency you know mahindra has defined around seven competencies that should be inculcated in 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 all the managers starts with innovation then it is customer focus not in the order of ranking or priority team work people focus result orientation strategic thinking execution excellence and sustainability actually sustainability we are kind of debating whether sustainability should be a competency or it should go into the core values of the company but very happy to say that the new generation have debated we have a concept called shadow board whatever boards we have we have a shadow board where if you have to have a membership your age cannot be more than 35 years okay and you must have worked in mahindra for 2 years so their job is to only criticize the actual board so they criticize and say those competencies will not take you further so i just picked up the list what they think are the are the new competencies that we should have and from there i was trying to give you some gain on whole brain approach trust has come out of the first competency that we should have how to build trust okay empathy now i'm not getting into the details of that that's the second ranking that if you do not have empathy you do not lead into 21st century anymore multiplier can you inspire people we always we have magical fuse with us where you start your innovation project you know where you can debate very frankly how can you multiply your magical fuse managing fear can you manage fear and here again i am not competent because command and control has got an element of fear you know if you do not do this will happen so how do you manage fear so that you leverage failure that's the competency that they would like us to develop for the next generation interesting i wish i had another 10 years of my work life uh, some of the things i cannot uh, unfortunately i am still stuck with uh, you know powerpoint uh, dr padhi very nicely explained that uh, you know there has, there is going to be a huge disruption and i fully agree with him how the dis disruption will come it just came to my mind last time when i was go going through singapore airport or i was going through one of the airport in stockholm it's very eerie feeling actually you know technology has moved you walk into a airport there is no one and i don't know how many of you have seen it because we are used to seeing airport where there are a lot of people you know people behind the desk somebody carrying bags and all those kind of call run is there this is an airport it's eerie you walk in no body around you put your mobile they don't print ticket everywhere it is connected you pass through the security they know you have come they give you a tag put it on your bag no one around there is a very interesting article why i i, I just uh, read in mckenzie and i suggest that all of you if you have got access read it it's one of the best articles written from you know kind of economist point of view and he talked about oslo airport to start with and i immediately could relate with him how it feels to walk through oslo airport where there are no one whom you can interact with it's only the machines he argued a very good case and dr pradeep maybe i'll be uh, i'm i i'm apologizing but uh, there is the debate actually are we really going to create job because these economists make a very very interesting case he said the horses who left that 
you know, the carriage. We didn't see them getting any other job. Now, it may be true, it may not be true, it's left to debate. I do not know what is going to happen, but if the first industrial revolution, what we talked about, what was the effect of first industrial revolution? It was French revolution. Because 500 French people is to one British people used to compete because of steam powered, whatever, machinery. India was facing it much later. In between Germany faced, Hitler went for war because of un un unemployment he could capitalize. So there are many such issues, but we have seen job shrinking. India today, if you ask me as a corporate guy, what keeps you very, very worried, it's the jobless growth. We are growing, but job is not growing. I have a request that, uh, you know, I would request that some of you, if you can, I have already appreciated you that you come Saturday morning to listen to a lecture, very disciplined, in same kind of spirit, at least 50 of you can break up into groups sometime, spend one or two hours searching through the internet, what's going to happen? There are a lot many articles, but please do that because this is what we need. We don't have an answer, but I'm very hopeful the answer will come from you. You know how to handle it much better than we can do. It's going to change in every aspect. Like you talked about EV, today 30% of my portfolio is internal combustion engine of automobile. What am I going to do? So that gives you an opportunity lens. I am working very hard on wind power. I am working very hard on solar so that I can switch portfolio. Can my alloy still get into mobile? Can my alloy still get into uh, uh, you know, TVs? Then I have a portfolio to handle when 30% drops out in terms of uh, internal combustion engine or autos of today by 2030. I talked to you about business model. You know, there's one gentleman I hired almost 25 years back. He said, I have developed a competency. I can listen to you when you are teaching. He was giving a classroom example. With one eye, the other eye, I keep it on my lunch box. Because the first day I attended the school, somebody stole my lunch box. I was very hungry. So I've developed that competency. I'm listening very carefully, but I'm looking at my lunch box. So you got to look at your competitor in the same spirit when you are looking at your own business. This is called keeping an eye on the competitor moves. And the regulatory changes will come as another disruption. You know, yesterday it, you have not seen the way the regulatory disruption is going to come. One has to really uh, look at it. You know, talking about the disruption, this you need not... Uh, understand fully, this is the whole value chain of the process of making steel. You melt, you refine, then you go for rolling, you go for forging, you make heat treatment, you do finishing operation, a whole lot of value chain. I really request if some of your students are very interested, you know, they can come and have a look at it. But I'll tell you another small story before I go back here. I take interviews of onboarders, people who are joining, or people who will report to me. In between, I do not take interview because I think my senior staff, senior management is very, very competitive on that. Why I talk to people who are on board? Because I get to learn a lot of things. One of the brightest guys that I have seen in very recent past, he came, absolutely, I, I, I would have loved him to join. But finally I asked him, are you joining? He said, no, sir. I said, why you are not joining? Is salary an issue? He said, no, sir. But we are a very purpose-driven company. He said, that's also okay, sir. So why you're not joining? He said, sir, your shop floor is so dirty. Only managing director's room is very clean. So when I have got a potential to become managing director, I'll join this company. Straight. <laughs> so, you know, you got to look at this kind of industry with a different lens. Now, that disruption, when it comes in, we are looking at, we are not working, we are watching three things. How steel will be made? Tomorrow the whole process of steel melting in 10 years will change. Very advanced research is going on in MIT. The problem is Trumpian once again. Most of the steel companies started funding MIT knowing that you cannot pollute the environment or global warming, all, all of you have 
heard about it, read it. So they, the gentleman, the doc, uh, professor went very deep into the research. Then as soon as America was trumped, the funds went away. So he was in deep trouble. But fortunately, NASA has come into his you know, kind of help. Because when you, and if you generate steel in that process, you get very, very pure oxygen. And that's what NASA is looking for. But if that comes out in commercial scale, overnight we are obsolete. We cannot compete. Then we have started looking at it in a different scale of 3D printing. Now, if you can just make liquid steel, put it in a 3D printer and make your shape of whether it is crankshaft, bearings, whatever component, engineering component you're talking about, the whole value chain is lost. The complete value chain is not required after steel melting and refining. We are also looking at nano steel. And this, these horizons have to be watched very carefully. You know, I'm not getting into the metallurgical details of nano steel, but very roughly, we put a lot of alloys of nickel, molybdenum to get the right property of steel. But today the research is very advanced that you do not need any of the alloy, which is good for the planet because it's not extractive and hence not emitting. You can change at the molecular level to get the same property without. So when I was talking to my colleagues, they said, are you a well wisher of alloy steel? Why are you talking about all these things? You do not need alloy to make the same kind of steel. That's the creative destruction. You've got to destroy your current model to stay competitive in future. So that's very, very interesting, but it's very, very, you know, hard way to go ahead. Now, this is what I talked to you about, the three things that we are working on. But we know that we have to also work on AI or MI or machine learning, diagnostics, because we do not get the skill today. You know, we have a lot of management skills, but we do not have a fitter. We do not have a plumber, because those are traditional skills. You know, a fitter's son used to become, or that day the gender diversity was not much. I have not seen, I have seen a melting operator, very strong lady, but I have not seen a fitter as yet who is very strong. So, it used to be traditionally family skill. Sons and daughters gone to Hinjewadi. I don't have fitter. I can replace myself in five days. I know all the good headhunters. I'll ring them up. I said, I am leaving, get my replacement. In five days, I'll select, show it to my boss, walk away. And I tell my headhunter friends, give me a fitter. They said, sir, one year. Plumber, one year. Good electrician, one year. You don't get those skills. If you don't get those skills, the word in cribbing, so you got to get into this kind of machine learning environment, which will be self-diagnostics, you know. Circular economy, another big thing coming, whoever is walking into 21st century. You don't waste. Our generation was linear. Buy, make, waste. You have to put it back into the economy. And what I talked about during uh, Professor Porter's model, unprecedented collaboration is the way. You know, today BMW, Toyota collaborating. You know, the competitors are collaborating. What better way of collaboration can come to walk into 21st century? Okay, I talked about the Oslo airport, no human care. Please read this article. It has just come out in October. McKinsey, uh, an author called W. Brian Arthur. You will love it. So, I'm not starting from industrial revolution, but I wanted to say, you, all of you know, the first morphing was 70s and 80s when the processors came in. Second morphing was internet. Now we have got into sensors. And I was listening to somebody in one of our management conference. That guy said he was a futurist and generally he didn't go wrong in the last 20 years. He said in next 15 years, you will carry 1,100 1, sen sensors with you. I didn't believe that figure. He said it's going to happen. So I'm just waiting. 1,100 sensors all across me. What do I do with all those sensors? He said, whether you like it or not, it will be with you. So the artificial intelligence is an external intelligence. You know, most of you know about it. I'm not getting into the detail. But how business will adopt, it remains to be seen. You know, it will be adopted because technology progress cannot be halted. But I am still, sir, very worried of jobless growth. I have not seen papers giving very 
clear path that job will be replaced, we can get into another skill. You know, do I think the whole Oslo airport people have got another job? Very difficult to understand. But let's see what happens. I would really like you to research on it. Come up with a kind of pathway for India. I'll be very happy to see that research paper coming out of this university. Generally, <clears throat> there's no fun without a homework. So I'd like to leave this homework with you. And mind me, you know, our generation had one good thing. We are very, very nagging. If I said that I'll come back and listen to your, I will come back and listen to your lecture on how do we move forward into 21st century. Thank you very much. You know, good that those slides went away at the right time. You would have got bored more. And if you have got questions, I would like to take it. Uh, good morning, sir. My name good is Neha Bangar. I'm from BIMM, a senior batch. Sir, uh, in between, you talked about shadow board. Yes. Uh, which uh, criticize actual board. Yeah. So how does it work? And like, uh, I just want yeah, to know. The, the issue is there is a procedure laid down. So suppose, you know, Mahindra has got various sectors. So I, I slipped that slide. Suppose in auto sector, who makes the SUVs and Boleros and other things, they have a shadow board which comprises of, say, 12 people picked up from various cross functional teams. But there are two, year, uh, two uh, criteria. You should have worked in Mahindra for two years to understand the business, and you should not be more than 35 years. You know why. Okay. So they look at our strategy that we have drawn for individual sector, and they are like devil's advocate they need to criticize so that we can learn. So what do they do? They come up with their kind of presentation. They give it to the highest level of authority in the company. And we need to demonstrate that we just didn't call you and listen to you and forget about it. Our job is to pull it back into our strategy and next time show it to them that we have drawn it in. And excellent prizes are given, you know, kind of, uh, it works very well on a closed loop circuit. And because they know that at some point of time, they are going to take up the leadership role. But we demonstrate that we just didn't listen to you. It's just not a gaming. We have listened to you and the good part, unfortunately, the judgment of good and bad still lies with us, but we draw back their information into our strategy next year. But it's excellent. You know, some of the case studies, if I can share with you, the way they can look at, I was looking at a, you know, we don't call that we are selling tractors. We say we are building farm prosperity. They came up with such lovely kind of, uh, you know, tactical as well as strategical move. I think it helped the company quite a lot. Thank so, you. So all the judgments uh, lie within the shadow board or... or Pardon me? All the judgments lie no, no, in the No, no, the judgment is at the highest authority. Suppose it is, uh, uh, suppose it is auto segment. So it is Dr. Goenka and all his team, they will pick up in consultation with the shadow board that what should go into the strategy next time. That way. Yeah. Thank you. Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, so you talked about one should gear up for the change. Other than te uh, technologically being savvy, uh, what all competencies at a basic level a uh, student manager like us uh, should start building up uh, for the, that change we are talking about? Yeah, I gave you a whole list. Let me go back from working. You know, I think if you ask me what are the first three take, I have listed down too many. You got to have empathy. Because today they call the corner office is lonely, typically. But tomorrow, all of you are going to be lonely under AI. You will be only one person sitting and managing 50 different kind of issues. So you must have empathy built up. How does the other people feel? Until unless you work very heavily on that, you cannot leverage the human capital. You are so disconnected, but connected only over computers. So you need to have empathy about his thinking, about her thinking. What does she, you know, how does she or he behave in a given circumstances. The second one is the whole brain approach. I would re really request you to inculcate. And for that, there are ways of doing it. You cannot be only logical. You got to be creative also. So how to mesh two? Why I asked how many of our engineers? Because I have seen in my life people who come from social science background. If they are from history, anthropology, you know, uh, political science, 
they pick up much faster the creativity part or from liberal arts, you know, rather than what we engineers could do. So that's very much required to pick up that one. Okay, and uh, you know, the result orientation, execution excellence, strategic thinking, all were there, it will be there. But to understand risk and opportunity in one go, becoming how to take more risk with a risk appetite is a, a kind of competency we got to develop very first. This is my personal feeling, but yeah, that's what I think. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We are grateful for your time and effort you took to share your thoughts and experience on how data analytics can help us in future in various industries for doing different works. You also told us that age has no bar as far as education is concerned. We got to know about using the whole brain approach to be logical and creative at the same time. We once again thank you for your words of wisdom.